Did you know that the episode you are about to listen to is available on YouTube as a full multi-camera experience? Search for the Murder Police podcast channel on YouTube. Subscribe and see what you have been missing. And there was also a study in 2019 by Shelby McDonald. And she came out with a study that showed that 75% of battered women who had pets reported that the pet was threatened or intentionally harmed by their partner. Wow. And equally disturbing is that the abuse towards the pet was done in front of children 90% of the time. Warning. The podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast, The Murder of Todd Schumacher, Part 4. Welcome back, listeners. Thank you so much for joining us on the fourth and final episode of The Murder of Todd Schumacher. We were supposed to have Detective Rob Wilson with us this evening as we were recording, and Rob had something unexpected come up, so he is not with us. However, if you recall, on the recordings of Todd Schumacher, we learned about Todd's dog Monroe in the cliffhanger, which was placed in the oven. And our special guest we have with us this evening is Lieutenant Jai Hamilton with the Lexington Animal Control. Thank you, Jai. Thank you for having me. For coming here. We we learned about your name, as I said, when we were talking about Monroe in our our awesome cliffhanger that that, uh, Rob did. And I understand you, you got involved in that. Is that right? Yes. I thought so. Well, before we dive into how you got involved... Why don't you tell us a little bit about you and what you do for Lexington Animal Control? Yeah, so I am the cruelty investigator for Lexington Animal Control. So I handle all the cruelty calls that come in for Lexington. And you've been there for quite a while, I understand. Almost 15 years. Tell us how you got started with that. So I graduated from UK in psychology, and I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do. But I've always loved animals, so I thought, why not? get a job at the animal shelter. (laughs) So I was originally hired on as an adoption specialist, but then the human resources girl said, I I have to hire an animal control officer too, and very begrudgingly. And I said, well, what's involved in that? And she said, go running calls, go being out in the public, working with aggressive animals, bite cases, cruelty cases, you'll get dirty. People will yell at you. I don't think you'll like it. But I said, that sounds like a lot of fun. And then that is where my career started. And now you're a lieutenant. Uh Uh-huh. Awesome. Well, why don't you tell us, before we dive into this case on Todd Schumacher, um, you have a pretty cool hobby that I'm pretty envious of. Why don't you tell us about your hobby, what you like to do in your free time, and your awesome dog, Reckless, And his Instagram page. Of course. I love talking about my dog, Reckless. Uh, So I train personal protection dogs for a company. Uh, The company is called Protection Dog Sales, and we're located here in Kentucky. The owner of the business is David Harris. He has a lot of videos on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, protectiondogsales.com. In my personal time, I train dogs for him, but I also have my own dog that I've trained for competition. So I do something called Working Dogs of America, and we train in obedience and protection scenarios, so police-like scenarios. So I have a lot of cool videos and cute videos, too, of my dog. And his Instagram page is reckless underscore V-O-M underscore Logan Haas, L-O-G-A-N-H-A-U-S. I've noticed those fancy dogs like that have those Vons and That's right. Bombs and Hosses in there. That's a very fancy kennel name. I think it must be. Well, so your dog, he he as I've seen in some of those videos that we watched prior to our taping this evening, he really clamps down on people. Oh yeah. 
So he all that's it. on command, right? <laughs> that's right, but only bad guys. Only bad guys. So he can he he can come off of that person as quickly as he went on. Uh huh. So we really balance control and power. That's the art of it, right? You have a yeah. dog that's super powerful, loves to bite, loves to chase, all that prey draft. But you can rein him in and he can be completely obedient to you. You can have a bad guy in a suit running around yelling, but he's going to be completely neutral until I give him the command. How neat. Mm -hmm. Well, we certainly need to spend some more time with you. And I'd love to watch Mr. Reckless work sometime. Not on me, but I'd love to watch him work. (laughs) Yeah, I think you should be in a ring suit. It, uh, but and thanks for coming too. And again, Rob was going to be here. He had something come up because, uh, he loved working with you on the case and, uh, the whole perspective. And again, what we want to talk about is when different parts of government come together to work for the same thing. And, and this one kind of came together like that is, uh, the services that animal control provided. Uh, I know that I benefited from that, not just when I was an investigator, but any of the assignments I had too. But, Tell everybody what animal control, specifically in Lexington, because you can speak to that. What does animal control do from the simplest thing to the biggest thing? What's it all about? Yeah, so we handle all animal-related complaints for the city of Lexington. So anything from loose dogs to sick animals, injured animals, animal rescues, bite cases, and cruelty cases. So anytime an animal needs help, call animal control. So the neighbor has a dog out and it's 10 below zero and it has no shelter. You handle that. Mm -hmm. And likewise, it's in the sweltering heat and there's no water in the bowl and it's chained to a tree. You handle that. Exactly. So I imagine you probably get some pretty irate owners when you come around talking about, I'm going to take your dog. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those professions where no one's ever really happy because a complainant calls because something horrible is going mm-hmm. on and we weren't there to stop it before we knew about it. Yeah, the only people that got is firemen. They they nailed that yeah. up a long time ago and we're still envious about that. Is yeah. that yeah, and great then mm, the heroes. <laughs> right. We get on scene and the owner's like, You're doing too much. <laughs> so nobody's ever really happy, right? Right. But um we do what we can with the laws that we have. Kentucky has not so great laws. There's a lot to be desired, but you know there are minimal standards of care, and so we make sure that that's being followed. Um, sometimes, you know, there's lots of situations that I don't think is fair, but I can't necessarily do anything. Mm-hmm. My hands are tied because our laws are pretty lax. But that's true with anything you do in the criminal justice system, mm-hmm. whether it's animal control or law enforcement or anything. Is that, that there's a coloring book, and you have to stay inside the lines, and that's a great attitude to have because if you get frustrated with it, you'll wear yourself out. But until things change, you have to work inside and color inside those lines too. So, it. Uh, how many people do this in in Lexington? For how many people you work with? So we have sixteen officers. Sixteen. Wow. Yeah. Think about this, and just for perspective, sixteen people. Population probably humming around three hundred thirty thousand. Uh, maybe. I, I could be wrong. Two hundred eighty square miles. I think. I think it, it's a pretty good sized metropolis, and only sixteen people. Yeah, so and we're um, twenty four hours a day. Oh, wow. <laughs> every day. Yeah, so you stay so, busy, right? Oh, yeah. Any idea how many cases you handle in a year? Like how many? How many calls? Not off the top of my head. But there's not a lot of dead time, right? No, absolutely then, not. There we go. So yeah. we have a dispatcher. We're like a mini police department. We have a dispatcher. We have calls pending. We have, I mean, I I start my shift and I'm call to call to call. Wow. Good for you guys. Do excellent work for sure. And again, that's that's where we're coming to on this case is where that that folds over into different things and and get to work. And again, Rob spoke highly of you. The only thing we did wrong probably in that last episode is I butchered your first name. And I apologize that. I apologized before. I wouldn't it's, even embarrass myself. Maybe the listeners don't remember. But no, go, you go right on yeah, ahead. It's a, well, Tell I'm our just, listeners what you called, called her. called vulnerability. Thank you for No, it's called you messed up. <laughs> exactly. I'll tell the listeners he called her chai well, as in the yeah, T. Yeah. However, I kept saying it starts with a J. It's got to be Jai. Mm-hmm. And you said, no. I thought it was much her more complex. Her name is sometime. Chai. And I exactly. said, J, don't make that sound. And you said, I'm telling you, it's Chai. Yeah. So- I was so embarrassed when I said this evening, well, actually, I really wasn't. I said, can you tell me how to properly pronounce your name? To which she said, Jai. Mm-hmm. And I looked at you and I think I just smiled. I don't know. Maybe I rolled my eyes probably. But it is Jai. Yeah. That's her name. There might have been some weird American sign language with one finger. I can't remember, but it's usually like that anyway. It but is. anyway, we digress. Jai. 
Yeah, Jai. So thanks for coming and talking about this stuff because this case, again, what Wendy was talking about is, and I think it got the listeners' attention. It, it's it's bad enough that you have a a person that's been murdered, and I don't think people compare them this way, but uh, a dog gets put in an oven, and 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 that that rattles people just as much as as the other. So, uh, can you tell us how you got involved with the case? How how did how did you how did you learn of it and and, and tell us the ins and outs on that? So before the murder, um, we were contacted in September of 2014 by an emergency vet clinic, and they had said that Todd had brought his dog Monroe, who's a beagle mix, to the emergency clinic because his boyfriend Matt had put him in the oven. So we went out there and investigated that. Monroe was okay um, overall. He had some burns on his paw pads and he had singed hair, but he survived that. Um, and we also went to the home and uh, took a look at the oven, found what we think is a lot of dog hair inside of the oven. So it was pretty, pretty uh, unique. It's a strange situation. Yeah, it's not every day you think of putting a pet in an oven. I would never think of that. I mean, you have to think what sick person does that. Mm hmm. So did you conduct an investigation or did you get to talk to either of the guys about this? Yeah. So um, a couple of days after, Todd and Matt both came into animal control and Todd want, said that he wanted to be there for Matt and that this was you know, a terrible thing that had happened, that he was going to confess to the crime. They were going to take whatever punishment you know, that was waiting and that they were going to move forward with their lives together. So I think he was really in this role of wanting to help him and be a better person. And this was like a low point in Matt's life. Right. So they both came in and Todd is a very large, uh, handsome, almost cowboy character. And Matt is this really small, like dark, kind of pale. I would never put the two together. So we did the interview and Matt did say that he that they had been fighting. They had moved in together, that he had been fighting with Todd a lot that Todd had went to work, he had made a pizza, and after he made the pizza, he put Monroe into a hot oven. Did he give a reason why? So he made it very clear that it was nothing that Monroe did. He wasn't mad at Monroe, but he was mad at Todd. So, so he, he's going to pay Todd back and punish Todd by hurting, hurting his Monroe, dog. which would ultimately hurt Todd sure. the most. Do you see that in uh, domestic violence? Do you see a connection or a nexus in domestic violence cases with that? There is definitely a link between the two. There's actually been a lot of studies on this. Um, they found that animal abuse is either predictive or co-occurring with interpersonal violence. And there was also a study in 2019 by Shelby McDonald. And she came out with a study that showed that 75% of battered women who had pets reported that the pet was threatened, or intentionally harmed by their partner. Wow. And equally disturbing is that the abuse towards the pet was done in front of children 90% of the time. Wow. So we, so to get at not only the other partner, but the children, because, I mean, most often times children love their little pets, and so as a way to to really stick it to to the children and to the family even more so, they do it in front of the <laughs> most innocent of all the children. And not to mention the poor animal. The more loved the pet is, the more vulnerable it is for abuse. So it's mostly perhaps a jealousy. I'm, I'm going to, you love your pet so good, so I'm going to take what you hurt. I'm going to hurt what you love the best. Mm -hmm. Yep. But that's what harm is all about in the end. And again, that force multiplier of doing it in front of the kids. Those are over, overwhelming numbers, too. Mm -hmm. Those those are, are frightening, actually. But And I never put that together. I guess it comes in that category of you don't know if you don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh uh, I think it, it emphasizes why uh, police departments probably need to work close with animal control agencies because there we have another indicator, maybe a potential indicator mm -hmm. of things in domestic violence. So if you had a a, a person who a friend of yours uh, that you suspect could be a victim and they start throwing things in like, well, the other night he or she did this to Fluffy or Buffy or whatever, that 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 might start registering a little bit. I never knew 
over 70 percent. I mean, that's crazy big, Mm -hmm. great, like almost routine, frightening, frightening. Yeah. And a lot of people, a lot of like battered people will delay leaving a situation because they're afraid of what's going to happen to the animals and they use that to control them. If you leave, what are you going to, what do you think I'm going to do with Fluffy? Mm. Will he be home when you get home? Right. And so a lot of people won't go to shelters because of that, but we're lucky here in Lexington that our shelter does what they can to keep families together. So there's different pathways to this, but they try to keep the pets with the victims. Now, you did tell us earlier prior to the show that there's a law out now. Um, Can you share that with us regarding um, the EPOs? Yeah. So last year, Kentucky changed their law so that pets could be included in emergency protective orders. Yeah, that's really great. Huge. Because when somebody comes down to the courthouse to do one of those one night, if that's their concern, is that now the people that are taking that EPO in Mm -hmm. can offer that and say, okay, there's there's what a great way. Mm -hmm. Because. That's one of the things we do know about domestic violence on the forefront, though, is once that control is established, it can be economic, it can be emotional, it can be anything as simple as the pet, Mm -hmm. is that anything they can use as leverage. And now if you have a a way to deal with that, that's great. And with shelters that'll, like you said, there's a pathway for the shelter to do that. That's excellent stuff. Mm -hmm. Pretty proud of Kentucky for for adding that in there. Anything we can do to make a, a person feel more comfortable getting an EPO, that's what matters. Now, I will say on the flip side of that, you know, I learned that their requirements are so bare minimum. It's almost disgusting oh, what, yeah, they, yeah. what they require, just some little bit of basic food, water, and what they consider shelter, which is not what I would often consider shelter for a pet. And that's kind of sad that there's no stiffer rules or laws on. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, uh, and n- not to throw Kentucky down because it's probably that way across the country, but. Talk about that minimalistic approach to the law and when it becomes something that you all can come in as animal control and act. Because yeah. that's a lot like being frustrated with laws against humans that you're like, it takes what before we can do that? Talk a little bit about what yeah, that is. So uh, I want to say Kentucky's 46th out of 50 when you rank the animal cruelty law. So there's a lot to be desired. The laws are either very basic or so poorly written that they're hard to enforce. Uh, So as far as like failure to provide, I mean, it's pretty minimal, right? Food, water, shelter, vet care when needed. But the majority of our complaints are neglect cases. Um, And then we have, you know, a a small percentage that is intentional abuse. You know, and and that is really kind of um, kind of a little bit embarrassing. You said 46 out of 50. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, it, it is very sad that that people don't take into consideration the preemptive things that happen prior to animal abuse, what is what people are capable of. If you're if you're willing to stick a dog in an oven, obviously we know what happened to Todd Schumacher. He was brutally stabbed over a hundred times by the same person that put the dog in the oven. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and David and I went uh, just a few months ago, a couple of months ago to California and we were amazed at how we stayed at some very high end Marriotts in Ritz Carlton, even. They people just had their dogs in there. And we were talking about how great it was that they welcomed them. And and um, you know, everyone knows I love children. I, I own child care centers for a living. But we often talk about how <laughs> sorry parents, <laughs> how the dogs are better behaved than the kids. And you see these people in there and the dogs are just on like a set stay or they're just down. I mean, they're maybe wagging a tail, but they're not jumping off the, you know, Ottoman over there like little Bobby is because his mommy thinks that it's so cute and she's applauding him and he's still doing it and driving the rest of us crazy. But but we were so happy with how many restaurants and hotels that just had the little dogs in there and little bowls it, out it was, to drink. It was neat and hats off because we have a, a lot of people in California listen to the show and hats off to them. But it was overwhelming, Jai. I mean, it was like it was it, I mean, you would smile because you'd go into, into one of these hotels or a restaurant. And it was like crazy. I had a, a great aunt when I was growing up that could not turn a stray away and Aunt Mary. And she had a little beer joint in Louisville called the Five Point Inn. And she always had four or five dogs in there and fans. So hair was blowing. And her thing was, if you don't like the hair, find somewhere else to eat. I love it. Oh, God, she was that way. You <laughs> loved her. At one time, she had 17 dogs in her house. And when the neighbors complained, she 
secretly in the, on a down low went and got a kennel license. I mean, Mary could not turn somebody away. So to be out there in California, what, what I think you're seeing and I'm, I saw was they really have elevated dogs up where I think yeah, they, they are anyway. And uh, so, again, to see somebody treat that a dog that way in our society is just nuts. And, you know, we, we've always talked about, I think most people know, the connections between animal abuse and, for example, serial killers. Uh, that's like textbook. Anybody can pick that up and run, and it makes a lot of sense. But this nexus in the domestic violence, mm-hmm. that's a little bit different because mm-hmm. domestic violence is, is a little bit, obviously, it's not like serial killing, but what a neat marker. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I'm i trying to think back on domestic violence cases I had to see. I can't, but we weren't registering it. So mm-hmm. I think for somebody in the, in the game today, that should be something to pay attention to. Yeah. Definitely an indicator. Mm-hmm. But yes, yeah, she would have loved my Aunt Mary. She was amazing. Love dogs. And the dogs Love in dogs. California. Oh, yeah. Uh, hats off everywhere. to California. They the got airports it. everywhere. Oh, they've nailed it. They've nailed They're it. They're just so happy. Yeah. Wagging their tails. Just so happy. It's so it was very nice to see how they welcomed them. And then it's kind of embarrassing to know that we're 46 out of 50. Yeah. And we just provide food, water, and what half as shelter is considered shelter. It's a lot like every other law. It uh, law. There's always that fine point when when does law become something that's culturally acceptable with morality wise mm-hmm. with a group of people, and and when does it go into actually, even though we all in this room we'd agree that it's not enough, but man, there's always that sweet spot that we're yeah, trying to look for. Criminal? That's mm-hmm. it. And 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 when do you take somebody who is just has enough to feed care? I mean, in some cases that probably works well. Uh, but it's the people that are probably on the other side of that that benefit from that. That, but that's true in in human law too, right? Mm-hmm. Is when you're on the edge and and you're like, mm, not quite there, not quite there. But what a nexus into that. Um, so you got to meet. Uh, I, I shouldn't say that you met the uh, the victim of this crime. Mm-hmm. Uh, unbelievable. Not not knowing anything was about to to come to his life. Now I believe yeah. you had told us also. Can you share with us how? The murder trial of Todd, they wouldn't reference the past with Monroe. Good, good question. Because I was going to ask too, like how these things. Because you're ramping up, and at in, uh, I guess it's pretrial after pretrial after pretrial, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the story of our life. I knew it happened in murder cases. I didn't would have never have dreamed in this that we could keep stalling the, the bus. But so okay, it's running through, and and it's going through, and then boom! How did how did you find out that a murder occurred? So after the interview, we charged Matt with tortured animals, and that was he pled not guilty in arraignment, and then they have a pretrial date, pretrial date, pretrial date, and so this is about eight months in, right? So no court resolution, but still in the hands of the court. And um, I was just scrolling through my phone, and I saw in the news that there was a murder on Lamont Drive. And I instantly knew that these were Monroe's people. You just knew. Mm-hmm. So when that happened, I believe you had said that they couldn't look into what had happened prior with Monroe. They wouldn't bring that into the murder. Yeah. Right? So that was so surprising to me because that was 2015. I had never been to a jury trial. I'd never testified. I was just going to watch to see the process, right? Because we, we were involved in it to some degree. And when I heard that they wouldn't allow any testimony about Monroe, I couldn't believe it. Because to me, that's a pattern of behavior. Yes. That's a character thing. That's right. And it led up to it because that was a way of domestic abusing Todd by means of his dog Mm -hmm. until it escalated that he ultimately killed him. Yeah. So you would think, why would you not look into the past history of this person? Yeah. Because that was, I think, a a precursor to what was about to happen. I completely agree. And what did, I think you said you uh, were with Rob Wilson. What did Rob tell you about that? Because. That that's normal. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, you prejudicial stuff i mean it, it's a it's a tough thing and again just like we talked about you have to have the coloring book and kind of live and even if it's frustrating is that uh it's it's really tough it's a, the whole concept of what a fair trial is based on that's the tricky part about this business is stomaching that mm-hmm. is knowing and not being able to say that and uh i can take it a step further it's so so like when you testify it's like a landmine and uh and I've seen it happen before if, if, if you're testifying in a murder trial. If, for example, Rob or any of the other investigators had just mentioned that, mistrial. 
Mm-hmm. It would have been that fast. Oh, it yeah. would have been objection, and, and it probably would have come down the way. Because I've, I've even seen, uh, for example, you can have a murder suspect on trial. Patrol picks him up on a warrant. It's just a warrant. And and I saw it happen one time. And if the officer gets on there, and some defense attorneys, they're gifted about trying to walk into this. If the officer drops their guard and they say, well, how did you encounter him? And they say, well, he had this misdemeanor warrant. Objection. Boom. New trial. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing goes when, when people talk about Miranda, you have the right to say anything you say will be used against in court of law. That's not true. Is that, but by the time the jury gets that statement that we make, they're going to redact it because if the person says, well, I was in jail three times, that goes away. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So that's hard. Yeah, That's hard. And in the end, you're right is now looking back, we know that's a a prior preceptor of that behavior. If the jury would have known I believe there would have been a very different outcome. Exactly. Yeah. Because that Rob in the last episode is that we're, we respect the system, but every now and like he said, that jury got it wrong. And I've seen it before too, is he said that they bought his act. And uh, you may be able to speak to that about the idea of how convincing a guy like that is when you're interviewing him on putting a dog in the oven. Yeah. Um, so they really sold this idea of it being an isolated incident. So Matt, although he admitted to what he had done, said that he was drunk, he had come off his meds, that he had a mental break, that this happened, but he had went to seek help after. He had checked himself into the Ridge, which is the mental health facility here, and he got put on different meds, he went to counseling, and that this was an isolated incident. And he's all better now. Yeah, he's a good person, he loves animals, it won't happen again. And Todd wanted to believe in the good in him. Mm. Like most domestic victims, yeah, they want to believe that something, you know, they're going to change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, They're going to be different this time. They really want to believe that. How sad. And it is very sad because it makes you wonder, were there any episodes after you came in contact with Todd and Matt? Or had it happened prior? But maybe there were no injuries on Monroe. Maybe it was a kicking when Todd wasn't around or threatening. S- So you're right. There probably was other things and we just don't know about it. Mm -hmm. I will say that I found out from the family that after Todd was found murdered, the family had told me that Monroe had gone missing several days before the murder. They suspect that there was an argument about where is Monroe? What happened to Monroe? They believe that Matt killed Monroe and we never did find Monroe after. Mm. Wow. Wow, how Any, sad. Anybody would put him in a hot oven, yeah, would probably. Oh, I'm yeah. sure. And, and you know, who knows? Maybe that's what escalated to the fight. Uh, as we know, you know, with some of you, uh, victims, it's, you know, when they finally say they're leaving, maybe maybe it escalated uh, over Monroe and it just got out of hand. Who knows? Of course, we'll never know. But that's so sad that, and and, you know, just to think that Todd was probably looking so hard for Monroe, just hoping, maybe out driving and searching, who knows. But to know that one person can take that, Matt in this case, mm-hmm. and and use that against, yeah. against Todd. Yeah, animals are used to control, manipulate, and punish victims. Okay. And they're really the perfect victim, right? Because they can't talk. They can't tell anyone what happened. And most dogs are always happy to see you, even if you're even if you are an abuser. We've had dogs being who were intentionally abused by their owner, and they still love them. Yeah, Mm -hmm. the the unconditional love. It might be the only time that really exists on the planet. We'll leave that there, but for sure, you know. But we have a miniature horse you met tonight, Mm -hmm. Polly, that was abused incredibly, and uh, and it's taken a few years to get her to let us catch her and touch her and and everything, just because of that that abuse of that trust. But uh, yeah, so it, it so it, it it's frustrating, right? It do you know if it you first like, can I say this is for the listeners that are interested in crime and in the criminal justice system is go to a jury trial. Yeah, it, I mean, I'm not going to say you should spend your vacation there because it would probably take a vacation. But if people really want to know, go sit in one. Yeah. Everything from opening from uh, jury selection to opening arguments all the way through closing. And uh, and learn how that works. It's actually pretty fascinating. Yeah. It, it's well, and likewise for people who, like me, didn't realize people like Jai's position existed. If a person has a love for animals like you do and wants to protect them, how does a person do what you do? 
it, it, do they just go apply at a shelter? Do, how's a person do your job? Um, well, as far as like emotionally, uh, I, it can be hard. There's going to be like good days and bad days. Um, and I can't save every single dog. Mm -hmm. I can't get every animal out of a bad situation. So if I look at it as like an individual, I can save this animal's life. Then it means something. Um, but when I think of it as a whole, it's like you're, you're spinning your wheels all the time. Right. Um, But I have really enjoyed seeking justice for those who can't speak for themselves. And that has really propelled me. And so if I can hold somebody accountable for something they thought they could get away with because it's just an animal, then that is really my driving force behind what I do. So if a person wants to do your job, is there um, college for it? Do you just go to your humane or animal control and say, I'd love to be an animal control officer? Yeah. So there's different pathways to it. There are um, several national schools that you can take. A lot of animal controls don't require it. We do a lot of training on the job. Um, But, you know, it's all different depending on where you live. Cool stuff. Just because I think a lot of people probably are interested in that. that, Yes. uh, uh, Because I think if you... Uh, my daughter, Brooke, uh, for example, left banking last year and got a job at a vet clinic. And she loves animals that yeah. much. Um, so it, it's one of those things that draws you in and, and takes care of it. And again, my Aunt Mary, 17 dogs in a house. That, that was a zoo, literally. It, uh, it it was interesting to watch that inside that restaurant, too, when she always had a handful of dogs. You loved her. You loved her. You wouldn't eat there. I wouldn't have eaten there probably. Because you, you hate hair. I'm a little particular and, about hair. Oh, there was hair. You had hair burgers. I mean, do you want cheese or do you want hair? Probably get both, you know, because it, it was just the way it was. But, hey, Mary loved them. Um, and you said something, too, about how it's it's tough. But I think what you said, too, is understanding what your role is, what your limitations are, and is the resiliency aspect. Because mm-hmm. it's true no matter what. If you do anything in the investigative side. You're not going to save the world. It, it's yeah. little pieces at a time, right? Yeah. It's one step. And I have had so many cases where I, I in my heart, I know somebody did this, but mm-hmm. I can't get all those puzzle pieces to fall together. But then you have the cases where it does. And that is so exciting to be on that pathway and something unlocks another thing. And all of sure. a sudden you have a great case. So that is that is something that's really now, exciting as an investigator. You, if a person has their animal removed from for being abused are there any laws or what do you do if somebody says hey they own dogs again and they're abusing again are there any Mm -hmm. laws that maybe says you can't own dogs anymore don't let us find out you're owning like a felon with a handgun Mm -hmm. of course they're going to carry on when they aren't supposed to but are there laws on behalf of animals that say you won't own another one that's a really great question So going back to Kentucky being a terrible state for the animals, we do not have anything in our laws, with the exception of the bestiality case that's very well written, that prohibits somebody from an an animal abuser from owning animals. So even if it goes to a jury trial, the options are jail time or fines. But you can own again. But you can own the same animal you abused. There's nothing Mm. that says you can't have that animal back. Wow. Yeah. Now, so, so, sometimes we can reach an agreement in a plea deal, but that's only two years. And a lot of times people get around that for the wording. Like they'll say only service dogs. There we go. Oh. Right. Or I don't own any dogs. These these are my roommate's dogs. Okay. So there's a lot of ways around the wording. Yeah. So maybe people need to talk to their legislators. I mean, really, this is that thing that when somebody's running for election. Mm-hmm. Hey, by the way. What, what do you yeah. think about this? And there's yes, no, and they are elected officials. So yes. if you call them and you tell them that these issues are important to me, they're going to listen to you. They want to be reelected. Sure. Now, you did mention something that I didn't want us to have to talk about on here, but since you've mentioned it, um, bestiality. Um, have you all, have you ever worked a, a case on that? We've had two recent cases involving uh, allegations of bestiality. Wow. So what are the laws on that? Uh, I mean, what have you, has it been prosecuted? Has anything been done? So in Kentucky, yes. In Lexington, not yet. We actually had a case where we just submitted some DNA samples to the KSP lab. 
which is really exciting for us because this will be the first case that we've ever had a sample submitted. So we'll see when that comes back at, you know, it might open the case up and we might get a conviction out of that. We have to stay in touch on that because but if sadly, that happens, we'll bring Marcy in. Because Marcy does the DNA. Yeah. And I, I know Marcy. I've been in contact oh, with her. Oh, she's Marcy. great. She's she is great. But yeah. sadly, she spoke at the animal could... control conference. Yeah, there we go. And yeah. she's coming back I, here. And I was amazed. She's a brilliant. Yeah. Well, all of them up there. Like, I just can't say enough good about the people. can't leave Laura out. No, that's what Laura's I'm saying. Awesome no, I don't know anyone else. Oh, I just know Marcy. No, the, the, we only know this. But me, and, me this. and Laura came up together from back in the day. So, yes, but the, it's an amazing group of people. Now, if that person doesn't get charged, they could get their dog back, even though you highly suspect it. So, bestiality is the exception because okay. it, it is a very well-written law and okay. it's a newer law. Okay. But every other law in Kentucky... There's no provisions for like, you know, keeping someone away from the animal they abused, not to own animals. It's literally just jail time and or a fun. Wow. Maybe that'd be a start. Sometimes you have to have that those things in front, kind mm-hmm. of the boilerplate for that. Maybe it'd be the start for the legislators to look at because that'd be good to see. So it's just bizarre that we're talking about DNA. Mm-hmm. With the look, dog and looking, the person. Looking for human DNA. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, listeners, but that's downright disgusting. Don't do that's yeah. That's awful. Yeah. That's awful. It is. Yeah. So. And they there is a documented link between people who have sex with animals and people who are into child sex crimes. I'm not surprised. Mm-hmm. If you're gonna be sick enough to do it to one, I'd say you're sick enough to do there it to go. the yeah. other. That that deviancy um, is normal. There's just no um exceptions or anything people can say that will change my mind about that. And mm-hmm. as our listeners know, I usually keep my opinions to myself regarding a lot of things, but um, the children and the bestiality, I'm sorry, that's, that's, there's no excuse no. for that. That's disgusting. No, I agree. For sure. So it, uh, it, as far as we work through the case and, and, and again, the frustration of not being able to bring it in. And I guess it couldn't come up in sentencing either. I mean, that, that's a, Completely. well, cause he, because he didn't, ple- oh, that's right. How do you, how did, how did the case close? So the case got taken from a murder to manslaughter. Gotcha. And then he got, oh, you're talking about the animal cruelty case? Yeah, but it all ties in together, oh, I okay. think. Yeah. And then yeah. he got two years for manslaughter. Got, oof. Oof. Or I'm sorry, he I think it was sentenced to 10, but he only served two. Sure, that would be about right. And then as far as the animal case, they just lumped the animal case on top of the murder case. So essentially he took a guilty plea, but they mm-hmm. just like combined it with his jail time he had already served. So oh, he's yeah. out? Yeah, well, he's that's out. That's what Rob yeah. said. He's probably out. He's probably out. He's out. Yeah. He's out. Yeah, good. Yeah, that's the reality of the game. Yeah. I think right I... Right here in our town, probably. I have I have very few people that that I worked that are still in a penitentiary. Very few. So help me understand this poor man was stabbed over a hundred times and this dog was put in an oven and probably killed by the same person. He served just a little handful of years. Correct. Does nobody see the problem with this? No, no, everybody sees the problem with that. It, it, but the thing is, is it, uh, probably, and we probably could have researched it. Maybe I'll put some on our website, but credit, Time served, credit in custody, waiting trial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All of that folds into that and everything. But it's, well, but, then, but like Rob said, is that Rob, and it's not common that people do this, but Rob said that he believes the jury got it wrong and he bought his act. Yeah. They, they, they were buffooned and, and swayed well, probably. And what a slap in the face it is to this man's family. There we go. Mm-hmm. There we go. How insulting. Yeah. They, I sat next to them as well at, at the trial and they were devastated. Sure. Like and and reasonable in the community should again that there's the community should be devastated. The community should be mad, and communities need to start expecting more. Well, and not only that, because if he's a great master manipulator, and he meets another person and involves in a relationship with them, he's likely going to explain his way of or not tell. And then there's potentially more victims, just like he, all domestic he, abusers are. They they got a next victim. It, it beyond domestic abusers, once somebody can take another person's life and rest easy with it, taking the second, third, fourth, and fifth, and sixth will mean nothing to them. Right. It, it, that that, that are, there's and I'm not going to get on a soapbox about it, but uh, absent real mental health issues, I mean real diagnosed mental health issues, that is a yin and a yang. And and if you're capable of it, you're just flat out capable right. of it. You don't look at it like you and I do. You and I would die if we had to do that, even if we were 
defending ourselves, it would crush us inside. People like that, when that silicone switch goes, that that's not even an issue. Sleeps well with it. Sleeps well with it. Um, it's people. I, uh, yeah, people should be mad. They should be mad. They should be mad that that we. Uh, uh, starting with things like animal abuse, I think people should be upset. Mm-hmm. The idea that we look at that lightly, mm-hmm. well, no. Now we're starting to get really good data. It, but we shouldn't have had to have it, but we've got data that shows that that's a precursor to other violent behavior. Well, that's kind of a duh. If you can do that to an animal, mm-hmm. then then you can do that to a human, right. and vice versa. So, yeah, those are the big things that the world's. I mean, we're we're living in a time right now where people are killing or attempting to kill people at rates that have never happened before um, at younger ages. But that's because we don't have any consequence right. and we have we have a lack of morality. Well, when know. you're serving two years for stabbing someone over a hundred times and putting a dog in an oven, there's no consequence. No. The average, I mean, there is no consequence. It, it, life, life in Kentucky for years has been always kind of just, I don't know, only uh, looked at seven years. So if you get a life sentence and just life, Seven years, maybe. I mean, you've heard of people saying that th- that when things go to the court system, it's a slap on the wrist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's a frustration that I have. And I know that the police officers have sure. as well. It's not just animal cases. But when you think of the crime committed and what the sentence is, is that really justice? That, there we go. The big right. question. Because yeah, that is the key word, justice. I mm-hmm. want justice. My, did, did we do enough for the victim? Yeah. Well, I would venture to say that Todd Schumacher's family... Did not feel it was justice. Well, no, and they got, they got, they really got shorted. God bless them. They got shorted. It, it's horrible. It, uh, it just, it's when you see it drop and fail like that, it, uh, it takes a little bit out of you. And I talked about it in one of those episodes, watching some of the trials I had, even, even if people didn't die and, uh, looking over and thinking, what made you think that you could come back so far mm-hmm. away from what actually happened here when it was all proven? It's just, uh, crazy nuts it uh and when people say the justice system fails it listen it if it goes to a jury trial that's like six to 12 people that fail let's be honest if it's in district court it's six it's 12 and that's the problem is that right. uh, god if if people would just walk into a jury room and be more guarded and understand that uh the people they're going to be evaluating they're they're not what you see in that room Mm-hmm. You know, it, you described um, uh, Matt really well uh, when you said he was dark and he was pasty and and, uh, and 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 you juxtaposed him against Todd is I can guarantee you when he went to trial, he nobody had that impression of him. Mm-hmm. But you saw him in the moment. And that and mm-hmm. that's, again, where people don't that that's what they don't get. Well, I think that's why body worn camera is so important is that now juries are finally seeing people who they act yeah. yes. who, who yes. they actually are yeah. and not the person that they're That's it. Yeah, hand. take the suit off in the Bible and make them buck naked, grease like a hog pig, screaming like they're crazy. And yeah. that's what everybody was dealing and with. That Rob night. was talking about that he played the victim really well. Yes. And that's what he did with us. Wow. That's what he did on the stand. Well, and again, I think it's back to that manipulating people. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he maybe felt like if he could convince you all that he was so remorseful and he would never do because he's better now. So I wouldn't say he was remorseful because he never uh, did show. Oh. He would did ne- never did cry, shed a tear or say he was sorry. Nothing like that during the interview. Perfect. Remorse. Wow. They're not. I've said it a thousand times. They're not capable. If yeah. you're capable of remorse, you probably won't go there where you're going to be. Right. It's not in them. Yeah. And that's it. That's what people don't get is that you'll have people say, oh, I'd, I'd rather them spend their life in the jail so that they think about it. No, they don't. They don't think about what they did wrong. They probably get kind of kinky thinking about the things they did and all candor. And uh, that's that's where people get it wrong, too, is that, you no, know, they're not remorseful, is it? Well, and I think ultimately what it sends the message to that person, Todd in this, I'm sorry, uh, Robin. I am sorry, not you, Rob. Um, Matt, in this case, or any other person who's like that, who does something this heinous, is if there's so little consequence for it, is it I mean, why not do it again? Because you're just going to probably serve a couple more years again. Well, that's, maybe. A, that's a discussion. Maybe. You know, we've talked about heaven, and that it'll happen with Commonwealth Attorney and, and maybe some other people. And, and uh, some of the best defense attorneys in town that I love and everything is that 
Those are huge social issues we probably got to iron out is mm -hmm. that uh, if somebody's evaluating a cookie jar and the cookie jar is, you know, full of cookies and you don't get into a lot of trouble, then oof, crazy stuff. We, we can't solve all the problems tonight, but these are these are valid questions. Yeah, we'll sure try. And, but, but you know what's neat is you see it. I don't look at animal abuse as being really, truly a lesser level than the other. Mm -hmm. It's human behavior. Yeah. It's the justice system that we have to play and work in. We all have to follow the same rules, which I think that's why y'all's work is beautiful over at Animal Control. And the the thing is, is that what's on the other side of it is the things that's out of our control. Juries, mm -hmm. things like that, mm -hmm. and the court system sometimes. So it, uh, good stuff. I, it, uh, thanks for trying, for sure. I mean, there's no doubt about that. As, as we kind of wrap up before we fold up and everything. We had another question we was going to ask her. Tell me. I'll tell her. Yeah, I'll please, ask her. Please do. What happens to pets when someone passes? When when an, an owner passes away, oh, you yeah, all take yeah. care of those? Yeah. Uh, so, rehoming those? Or what do you do if you are, are informed by the police that this owner has, you know, three puppies there? What do you do with that? We So if a, the police officer calls and needs assistance, we always go help. Um, in those kind of cases, we would bring them into the shelter and hold them for the next of kin. Okay. Good question, yeah. Wendy. Yeah. yeah Thank you, I, 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 I completely forgot about that because it's real. It's like, and again, there we are, is that you have somebody, you don't have like a relative right there. What happens to the dog or the cat? Well, you the know, parent? you always see on, there's some animal sites that I'm on and they'll try to adopt a parrot and they'll say these things live 70 years. So you need to have a backup plan. Yeah, for sure. In case the in case the bird outlives you. And yeah. then they, they pick up on what she's saying and they start cussing. Mm. <laughs> yes. There was a pet you shop. Be very careful what you say in front of a parent. <laughs> yeah. It, it was funny. There, God, I hate going on too many tangents, but growing up in Louisville, we lived in Crescent Hill and in St. Matthews, there was Haller's Pet Shop and there was a huge parrot in there. And we used to blame the kids that went to Trinity High School, but that thing would cuss like a sailor. And it was, the whole thing was, do I have time to go into Howler's Pet Shop and get this parrot angry enough to cuss me out? That was a stupid thing. That, that just that brought that up. But yeah, the idea that there we are, that there's the brass tacks of death investigation. One of those things that people don't think about. You go into their home and unfortunately somebody's lost their life, regardless of how, and a pet's there. How do we take care of the pets, right? And and I know that officers really took that to heart. That's why they called animal control. Is you know it's it's like wow, you know somebody's lost their life, but they're. I'd had officers spend a lot of time waiting for you all to come mm -hmm. because they were like, we've got to home this dog or this cat or this. You can't just leave it there. No, yeah. just the care. You know that that's a neat thing. So what a great service, right? What a great service is that is that people have that. So it. Uh, let me ask you this, because we talked about, I think you work for a wonderful boss as far as your, your dog training goes. Um, if people really love animals, Jai, what, what, how can they help? What, what are some things they can do to help? Yeah. Um, so I always recommend that people donate to their local humane society or some sort of nonprofit that helps animals. Um, in Lexington, we have the Lexington Humane Society. Um, and what was the second part of your question? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> it, you both are looking at me yeah, and I really yeah, feel the pressure. Yeah. Um, what can they do to help? And she yeah. said, donate to your local shelters. Mm -hmm. the second thing I was going to say is um, fostering. If you uh -huh. can adopt foster. And there's so many sites out there that will say they're looking for foster and then some get to have foster to adopt if you want yeah. the little pet. Yeah, and, I and, mean, especially right now, every shelter is full. This is a nationwide problem. So after COVID hit, people, are, they can't afford their animals anymore. They're breeding out of control. So every place is full. So the more people can foster, the more lives can be saved. Great. Yeah. And most places have a humane society pretty close to mm -hmm. them. And, uh, well, and you also see, uh, as I see or saw the other day, they said, um, you know, if you can't adopt, maybe you could pay for an adoption of a dog for uh -huh. someone else. So that way, maybe somebody really wants a pet. But, you know, if it's a younger dog, I think those fees are a little more expensive. So if you cover that fee for someone, mm -hmm. you know, that's someone may be more apt to take a pet knowing that they don't have to pay five or six hundred dollars. And I don't think people realize how expensive it is for these shelters to spay 
or neuter mm-hmm. and get shots or treat any illnesses or worms. Well, just to it's feed. It's very expensive. Right. And the feed, feed, yeah. Yeah, just to feed and give them a place. Yeah, and I know for Lexington, the cost for puppies are higher than adult dogs. But they, the reason is to offset that cost for the dogs that are there longer. So they've had mm-hmm. dogs there for years. Now they get enrichment. We've got um, a lot of volunteers that will take them out to hiking, to stay in hotels. I mean, oh, that's yeah. cool. the, in Lexington, the dogs have it made. But still, they don't have a family. Yeah. yeah. You know, so. Which is, that's what they're called for, right? Mm-hmm. They got to be with a family. Well, excellent stuff. I'll let Wendy say goodbye, but I got to thank you again for coming myself. And uh and, and one more time, it I think that uh, for the Schumachers, so many prayers and oh, thoughts for them. Oh, my word, it, yes. Uh, it uh, losing somebody. It evidently, clearly a, a benevolent, loving human being, mm-hmm. Todd. Uh, it, it, it's one of those things where you're like, I wish I'd met him. Seriously, as you think yeah. about that with these people. And, uh, and then for the bad shake, they get on the justice side, which is the unfortunate part mm. of the process sometimes. Just the bad shake. What a slap in your face. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much. Before we close, please tell our listeners and watchers once more about Reckless's Instagram page. Of course, I love talking about my dog. Sure. (laughs) It is, um, his Instagram page is Reckless with an R underscore Vom, V-O-M underscore Logan Haas, L-O-G-A-N-H-A-U-S. So go follow Reckless. And if someone is looking for a protection dog, tell us once more the name of your um, side agency if they wanted to purchase a protection pet. Yeah. So these are family-raised dogs that are good in all environments, but will protect if the need arises. And the website is www.protectiondogsales.com. All right. Fantastic. Thanks again, John. Thank you so much for coming to join us. And thank you so much for what you do. The world needs people like you looking out for the animals who have nobody to speak for them. So thank you so much for joining us and for trying to be a voice for poor Monroe when he was still around. The Murder Police podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims. So their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform as well as at MurderPolicePodcast.com, where you will find show notes, transcripts, information about our presenters, and a link to the official Murder Police Podcast merch store, where you can purchase a huge variety of Murder Police Podcast swag. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which is closed caption for those that are hearing impaired. Just search for the Murder Police Podcast and you will find us. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us five stars and a written review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcasts. Make sure you set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.